spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E.G. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Aloha and good morning. Thanks for tuning in here on this Wednesday. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, we continue to spotlight the upcoming election, and with j just a few days away, we wanted to spotlight some of the candidates uh, on the Democratic ticket who are running for governor, and we've invited them back on the show one final time to have a conversation with you, the viewers. That's right. And we invited the Democratic candidates, the leading Democrats, for uh, one show apiece. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green was to be with us last Friday, but uh, after initially agreeing, his campaign cited a scheduling conflict, and so he declined to participate. Uh, Kai Kahele joined us, Congressman, on Monday, so you can go back and watch that. And this morning, we are welcoming businesswoman Vicki Cayetano, of course, Hawaii's former First Lady. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, it's lovely to see you, and we'd love to hear about what these last few weeks have been. You are in the home stretch right now. What is the final push from the Cayetano campaign looking like? Well, it's continuing to get our message out, which is really important. You know, from the beginning, my campaign has been about bringing real change to tackle these longstanding problems that we keep talking about, bringing some practical, common sense exper uh, solutions, you know, to all these issues. So it's been a very busy time. So thankful to have our very dedicated and committed group of supporters and volunteers sign waving <laughs> and uh, just being at any and every forum or debate that's available. Now that's the heart of it is getting our message out to all the people on every island. Um, that's been my whole focus. With just three days away, is there any specific strategy that the campaign is going after? Any groups of people that you obviously are tar targeting, being that this is a mail-in election, many have already casted their ballots and already mailed them in. What is the strategy in these last three days to target uh, different groups of people? You know, campaigns today are very different from what they used to be. And I think one of the things we do know is that it's truly rather unpredictable and uncertain. You never know. So for our campaign, it's just about getting the message out to as many people as we can across all demographics on all islands. And that reflects how I would govern if I have the privilege you know, to be governor, is to get out to all the people, all islands, across all demographics. And that's what we're doing in these final days of our campaign. Uh, your campaign issued a release yesterday calling for the elimination of income tax for a certain sector of the population. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? How would it affect the individuals that you're hoping to give some tax relief to and what that would also mean for the overall state budget? So, you know, in talking to people on neighbor islands and here on Oahu, the biggest concern is the cost of living. And as you know, recently there was an announcement from HECO about their projected increases more due to a number of things that's not been controllable, uh, but the average resident now is going to pay more in our utility costs. So thinking about that, seeing the surging costs, whether you're shopping for groceries, whatever it is, how do our people, especially our middle class working people who continue to leave our state, you know, five years in a row, you've heard me say this, we are one of the few states that has the terrible distinction of a decreasing population. And the people leaving us are working class, our middle class. So how do we bring them immediate relief? So hence came the idea of how, how we can address this is by eliminating the state income tax on earnings of $50,000 and less. Let me just share with you the direct impact specifically to, to these people in that, air, in that uh, category. It translates roughly to 20 days or almost one month of pay that would go directly into their pocketbook. 
So $3,200 per year. If somebody is making uh, 50000 or under, it comes up to about $20 an hour, translates to one month of additional compensation that goes straight to them. And it's not waiting till they file their tax return. It's something that they would realize as soon as that can be implemented. So I would work diligently with the legislature and the new administration to be able to make this happen immediately. Um, I can't tell you what a game changer that would be. And I think it would also help to attract people back into the workforce uh, because of the significant uh, impact it would have on them. When talking about that, that's obviously going to impact the overall state budget as well, having these individuals not necessarily pay and contribute into the overall state fund and what is generated through tax revenue. How do you think that will impact the state budget? And would there have to be any changes that ha would have to be made to the overall operating budget to accommodate something like that? So currently we do have such a surplus that we have a little bit of time to look into this. But, you know, for me, the biggest thing is that we need to take care of the people who need it most immediately. Uh, we could look at the general excise tax. You know, one of the thoughts is to uh, consider an increase on the GET, a slight increase, because uh, the fact of the matter is that about 30 percent of the GE revenue comes from visitors, our tourists who come here. They pay that also. So that could be one possibility, a slight increase to that. And at the end of the day, also um, give a waiver, a moratorium, which I have already called for on food and over-the-counter drugs to offset that. So at the end of the day, it would be, the intent would be to be net neutral to the state budget, but most of all, being able to help the people who need it and the people that we want to keep here in Hawaii. $3,200 goes straight into their pocketbook. I mean, I know we talk about a rebate this year of $300, but when you think about it, considering the high cost of living and ever surging increases, we have to do more. And this is a solution that's win-win, and it doesn't cost employers anything, but I really think it would have a huge impact to the middle class, the working people. I want to ask you, you know, as we did say off the start, you are in the home stretch right now. There have been a number of forums with your opponents, a number of televised debates, and then, of course, different uh, community resources have had their own forums. So people have generally, if they want to engage, have had an opportunity to see you. What do you feel hasn't been asked or addressed in any of these forums? What do you wish that people knew about you and your candidacy that perhaps they haven't seen in some of these forums? I wish that, uh, you know, in these forums, it's never long enough. And the questions are usually cut to like a minute or minute and a half response. But I think I would like people to see that, you know, we need to all work together. That business, some people think that business is a bad word. But the fact is, if you don't have businesses, you don't have jobs. And so it's a marriage that has to be one without the other is not going to produce success. And I think for most businesses, especially the small business community that are local and family owned, uh, we are the job creators. And without business, you have no economy. And businesses understand without our people, if we don't take care of them, uh, we have no business. So it's really not a this or that or anti-business or pro-business. It's really all of us coming together, that's the only way we can dig out of the challenge, the problems that we are facing. And uh, that's what I feel I bring to the table is 34 years of leading businesses, not only through the COVID pandemic, but through multiple challenges over 34 years that we've had. And, uh, you know, I always say that the tests of good management, good leadership is not when things are going well. It's when things are going badly and how you survive and come out of it. That's how you can tell if you've been a good leader or not. You know, something pretty rare that we saw a few weeks back is when you and your opponent, Congressman Kai Kahele, held a joint press conference, uh, bringing up some questions uh, about the lieutenant governor, his financing and raising some other questions into his campaigns. 
Why did you feel that was important to have that joint press conference together with one of your opponents? And do you feel like some of those questions that you folks raised have been addressed? I appreciate that question. You know, I will tell you that when you aspire to the highest office in the state, you need to be vetted thoroughly. The people deserve no less than that. And there is such a difference between negative campaigning and factual reporting. So just as I vet people who come to work for us, think about the taxpayers. And with all these years that we've seen now of corruption in politics, you know, it really shows us that we have to do a better job. So while the congressman and I may disagree on a number of things, one thing we're both in agreement with is being an open book, being transparent. You need to do that because that the people of Hawaii deserve nothing less. And I am sorry, but the fact is, is that the Lieutenant Governor continues to not disclose the sources in his LLC. And I'm just gonna say it like it is, okay? The fact is that he has made over a million dollars outside of being Lieutenant Governor while he was Lieutenant Governor. And if you're working part-time as a doctor, by his own words, twice a month in a rural hospital, it's hard to understand how you can make that kind of pay. Uh, I got to tell you on a separate note, I've been looking at independent physicians because so many of them are leaving, retiring, and we're looking at how do we keep them? Because you can't just have corporate healthcare model. You must also have the independent physician. One independent physician working full time based on the insurance cap or reimbursement, made only $97,000, $97,000 working full time. This is in Honolulu, not in a rural hospital. So it does beg the question. And, and I think that people are either naive or are frankly ignorant if they feel that this is smearing. It's not smearing when you ask the right questions, questions that people deserve to have answered. We should want, expect nothing less. I want to get uh, your thoughts on some of the issues that you might have to manage if you were to get to this position. Uh, one of them, of course, being the stadium and how that build. Uh, we know that uh, the legislature allocated quite a bit of money to that project and that it is seeming to move forward. It, do you support building a, a stadium on that site or are you more inclined uh, to agree with the congressman who says that that should be devoted solely to housing? I believe that if we say affordable housing is our priority, then that's what should take place. I would not close my mind to a stadium, though I think that affordable housing is more important and should be there. But I will tell you what my more urgent priority is. I want to make sure that the whole process in managing this project of 350 to $400 million is transparent, has accountability, and moves with urgency. What we don't want is another rail debacle because this is taxpayer money and we need to make sure that we're diligent about how it's spent. Uh, I also think it's really important that uh, we get the community involved, uh, the people in that area so that if there's any opposition, I would rather deal with it early on than later. We need to face that and have those conversations. Another issue that you would have to manage is what's happening over at Red Hill. Since we last spoke, we've heard from the military base uh, on their timeline for the defueling, which could take about two and a half years. Uh, your thoughts, if you were someone that got elected into this position and having to oversee this cleanup, uh, do you feel that this is an acceptable timeline? And how would you work with the military to ensure the safe removal of the fuel? You know, that is not an acceptable timeline, plain and simple. And I would, try, I would get the message to the military that they have a lot on the line here besides Red Hill, the renewing leases coming up. And not having a good relationship with the community is going to inevitably impact those negotiations at well. So I would take it to the highest level to have those conversations and then work with our congressional delegation uh, to take it even higher in Washington, D.C., if need be, in order to address it in a much more timely manner 
and with all respect, in a much more acceptable manner. You know, I listened uh, to the Department of Health and why they rejected the plan. And uh, it seemed like it was a, a plan that was very much lacking in details uh, and just dragging out the time. And we can't have that. We need to address this with urgency. You know, you brought up those leases and it is sort of raises a wider point of what Hawaii's relationship should be with the military. Of course, the military is a huge employer and an economic driver in our community. Uh, those the people who live here who are part of the military are also part of our community. At the same time, there is a lot of mistrust that has been exacerbated by the incident at Red Hill. So what do you think Hawaii's relationship should be with the military moving forward? You made some very good points, Yanji, and I would take it one step further. We need to also consider how important Hawaii is to our national and global security. And as we have seen recently with China and the Taiwan situation, uh, Hawaii is a very important player to our global security. So we have to uh, consider, yes, the local relationship and impact, but also consider the global impact as well. Uh, but again, I think that communication, uh, candid communication is very important, relationships to build. And I think we must make sure that the military understands that while their presence is very key to Hawaii, um, we also recognize how important we are to them. And so once again, a marriage where the power has to be balanced fairly. You know, throughout this campaign and really just even today as we had this discussion, you know, you're talking a lot about leadership style. One of the things that your opponents have sort of targeted you and attacked you on in a few of debates is your lack of experience holding a leadership position in government, uh, having, of course, the lieutenant governor seated in the office that he is and Congressman Kahele serving both uh, in Washington, D.C., as well as here locally. Uh, how do you respond to those critics who say that a businesswoman like you may not be suited to take on the duties of the fifth floor of the state capitol? Well, I would ask my opponents and say that I don't think they have leadership experience. When you are one of 535 or one of 76, it is very different than carrying the weight of building a business, starting it, and then maintaining it, taking care of all your people, uh, balancing the budget, <laughs> uh, making payroll, that's the kind of executive being a CEO requires. And so I turn that around and say respectfully that they don't have that kind of leadership experience, especially one that uh, is needed in these challenging times. You know, there's a lot of money that's going to come from federal funding, uh, and we need to make sure that we manage them with transparency and accountability for the people of Hawaii. Uh, you have read so much about corruption or misspent money. I mean, just even two months ago, I read about $22.5 million worth of COVID test kits that were just thrown out because they had expired. $22.5 million. How can that be? Uh, and then the second thing, frankly, is once those federal funds dry up, um, you know, we have to be concerned about a looming recession possibly 2023, end of 2023, 2024. So having that kind of foresight and proactive approach to me is very key for the next governor of Hawaii. Campaign finance has come up a lot in this race. Uh, the three campaigns, uh, the three leading Democratic campaigns have really taken different approaches when it comes to how to raise money for these for, for their candidacies. I'm interested to know, you know, you've lent your campaign a significant amount of money. Why did you decide to make that investment? Well, you know, Yanji, being a first time candidate, we don't have the kind of pipeline that politicians build up over time. Uh, for me, it's an investment into the state of Hawaii. You know, we have always uh, been very uh, philanthropic and giving to our community. And to me, it's a good investment into Hawaii. I believe that it's Hawaii now needs leadership more than ever. And uh, I also feel, frankly, it's a real advantage in the sense that I don't owe anybody anything. I'm not beholden to any special interest group. So I can get to work for the people, the majority, the silent majority who has been so overlooked, frankly. You know, that's who I'm fighting for. 
And so I'm happy to do this. And I think, frankly, the message is uh, I'm very committed. I, I don't see how else you can see that. I'm very committed to this campaign and to helping the people of Hawaii. One topic that's making national headlines, especially this week, is what's happening with climate change. Of course, Congress uh, on just about to pass a historical bill that will help provide funding and different incentives uh, for climate change. That is a topic that does, hasn't really been discussed all that much here locally in some of the debates. Uh, but I wanted to get your thoughts on if you were to become governor, how would you address some of the direct needs uh, of the climate issues that we're seeing with uh, these storms that come through that are damaging roadways, the rising water. Of course, there is a lot of things that the environment uh, will happen around in the environment that will directly impact us here in Hawaii. Uh, as governor, what type of leadership or what kind of plans would you do to help this growing crisis? So I think there's multiple parts of climate <clears throat> management. And I think that's why, and, and you know, Dr. Fletcher did say in an article that he felt that none of the candidates really came up with a whole package. And he's accurate in making that statement. But I think that we need to address, <laughs> because it is a very complex issue, all the multiple components of it, including the coastal erosion, the re- uh, location of highways. We know what a price tag that brings to it and the communities involved to have those difficult conversations. But we also need to discuss how we can help the, the, uh, mitigate more impact to the climate situation. And one of the things very specifically that I would like to see is engaging the tourist the tourism, our tourists who come in here and really do impact our resources. So I believe that through HTA, the hotels should be a stronger partner in this. And I'd like to see the hotels as a start, putting in mechanisms in terms of monitoring usage of water, wastewater, utility consumption, uh, managing the flow of tourists better and their impact uh, to our to our state. With that said, I was talking to someone who retired from the business and it's interesting. He told me that the average hotel guest does spend about, utilize about two and a half times more of these natural resource, uh, of these resources than the resident does. So absolutely, we need to do a better job of monitoring that specifically. I think we need to talk about those homes going into the North Shore um, and not only on Oahu, but all islands, have those conversations with the community, work with the congressional delegation on federal funding and start putting in place a plan to relocate some of the roads, the highways, and also uh, addressing those homes that have to be moved uh, or eliminated. You know, those are very tough discussions, but they have to start sooner than later because the situation isn't going to get better if we don't tackle that. Then we have to look at uh, greenhouse gas emissions. You know, transportation is responsible for about 25% of our emissions. So trucks, uh, cars, vehicles, all of that has to be discussed. The practicality of making everything into electric vehicles, um, it's a good goal, but how are we gonna do that? Are we gonna have enough charging stations? Do we have, have enough power to fuel all those charging, to power those charging stations? Condominiums, homes, how do we incentivize people to get into electric vehicles? There's a cost to everything. And we need to address that so that we can start transitioning from just policy to being able to implement. But it is a lot that we need to do. We are almost out of time, but I'm interested to get your thoughts on the campaign trail. I'm, you know, I think that as someone who is running for public office, you have the opportunity of meeting so many different kinds of people and having so many unique interactions. I'm just interested to know about what your sort of, you know, the me some memorable moments from you about these interactions, what you've come to enjoy about meeting people, and and what you're hearing from the so-called silent majority that you referenced just now. Well, the takeaway for me is truly what I believe, you know, I, this is why I got into the race, is the silent majority. The working people are struggling, who feel that government takes care of uh, other parts of our community, but not them. The small business that can barely make ends meet every day. Uh, 
it's really tough. And that's what I'm focusing on. The stories on the neighbor islands, you know, in on Hawaii Island, healthcare is at a crisis there. And they've been talking about this for over 10 years now and still no solution. People are giving up and not having hope. And uh, I think I bring a different perspective and a determination. You know, when you're 66 years old, you really value every hour and every minute. So, so yeah, all the different people I've met on every island, that, that's what resonates with me, is the middle class, the working people, they're disappearing in front of us. And without a thriving middle class, you cannot have thriving communities. We need to address this with urgency. Uh, and just another question about the campaign. I mean, you've been a part of many campaigns uh, in your lifetime, but wanted to get your thoughts on what surprised you the most being a candidate this time. Is there, was there anything that stood out in your mind that maybe you didn't anticipate when you were entering this race that caught you off guard or surprised you at all? Uh, I think uh, how entrenched to an extent, I would say, the establishment is. And, you know, I will point out that for a state that is so democratic I am, and so inclusive, uh, I'm still surprised that there's still a glass ceiling for sure, especially, I think, as it pertains to women in top leadership roles. Uh, that took me a little bit by surprise. Uh, I'd seen it when I started my business 34 years ago. Uh, but here we are 34 years later, and it took the Republicans to have the first woman governor. So I find that very interesting and rather telling. <laughs> well, we're almost out of time. We just want to give you an opportunity to share a final message as folks uh, fill out those mail-in ballots, head to the ballot boxes, or perhaps decide to vote in person. Just a final word today to our viewers. Well, thank you so much, Yanji and Ryan, for having me. You know, I would just say that again from the beginning, the campaign has always been about bringing real change uh, to solving the problems we keep talking about, but never resolving. Uh, if you think things are great or the way they should be, then you shouldn't vote for me. But if politics as usual is unacceptable, then I say that I'm the candidate who has a different perspective, a different background altogether. And honestly, I don't think anybody would work harder than I would to address all these issues with urgency. I'm not beholden to anybody. I can make those tough decisions. And I believe that together uh, we can change politics in Hawaii for good. And we will. All right, Vicki Cayetano, thank you so much for joining us here this morning. We appreciate uh, your time and for being a part of uh, the show. And uh, we will see how things unfold on Saturday. Thanks so much. Aloha. Sorry about that. Some technical issues on my side, but we did say goodbye uh, there to businesswoman Vicky Cayetano, of course, candidate for governor uh, on the Democratic side. Interesting to get her thoughts about this home stretch of the campaign, bringing up, of course, that she is the only female in the race uh, going for this office right now and saying that there is still a glass ceiling and noting that Linda Lingle uh, is the only woman who has ascended to that office. And of course, that was a Republican, so she would make history if she were elected. We talked to her about some of the issues and really at the top of the list there was bread and butter issues, the issue of the cost of living, her proposal that she unveiled just yesterday to eliminate state income tax on those who make $50,000 or less. That would translate to about $3,000 in direct funds into paychecks right away. She said she would work with the legislator, legislature to make that happen immediately. And Ryan, you really heard her there uh, touting her business experience and saying that's really what makes her different. Yeah, and we heard that criticism by her, uh, of her by some of her opponents saying that she does not have the leadership capabilities to ascend to that position. But, you know, the former first lady uh, saying on the contrary, she's the only one that's had to deal with, you know, operating a budget, managing employees and, and sustaining the company that she has for so long. And if anything, she says she has the unique experience of having that CEO experience that makes her qualified for this position. She also spoke about just her overall thoughts of how the campaign has unfolded. Again, once again, calling on Lieutenant Governor Green to answer some of the questions that she and her opponent, Congressman Kai Kahele, brought up in a joint press conference just a few weeks ago about some of his uh, LLCs and what uh, other funding he has coming in uh, for additional income, uh, aside from what he makes as Lieutenant Governor, but saying that she believes that these are legitimate questions that need to be answered, uh, especially something that as we head into the last three days of the campaign, 
you know, they will continue to try to see if they can find ways to get these answers from the lieutenant governor. Again, we want to remind our viewers that we provided this opportunity to the lieutenant governor to come on here to answer some of the questions that have been asked about his campaign. Uh, he originally was scheduled to be, appear in this program, but later uh, had to decline due to what his campaign said was a scheduling conflict. That's right. And also interesting to know, you know, the three campaigns have had very different ways of funding their campaigns. We did ask her about the sizable amount of money that she has lent her campaign. And you heard her say that she really sees that as an investment, that to her, Hawaii is worth that investment, and that it actually, she thinks, gives her a leg up because it makes her not beholden to any donors. So interesting to hear her take on that. If you missed any part of this, remember you can always listen to this later as a podcast or watch again via the Star Advertisers website uh, or here on Facebook once we stop the live stream. But very interesting to hear. Uh, we are down to the wire now, Ryan. I know I sent in my ballot. I'm assuming you sent in yours. Sure. And uh, it will be very interesting to see the results come Saturday. Yeah, a lot of campaigns, of course, just working hard in these final days. And it's not only this race, obviously, that's drawing a lot of attention, the lieutenant governor's race, uh, the race for Congress, a bunch of uh, city council races also up for grabs. It is going to be a very exciting Saturday night for those who follow <laughs> politics. Yeah, for, for, for political nerds like us, we are looking yeah. forward to Saturday night. Uh, on Friday here, we're switching away from politics uh, for a bit to talk to the city's Department of Transportation directors. Uh, we are interested to hear from them about the efforts they are making to try to increase ridership, which fell dramatically during the pandemic. Of course, they're trying to build back that ridership base. Also, you know, we've talked a lot on this program about how a portion of the rail is set to be turned over to the city this fall. The folks that run the bus will also be running uh, the ridership for the rail. So they are now working on the uh, dynamics of that. Uh, they obviously need to do a lot of hiring, a lot of training, but with the deadline for that turning over in flux, the mayor now saying it could be the end of the calendar year. He doesn't necessarily expect it as early as October, which is what Lori Kahikina had been aiming for. Um, how do you stand up an agency and make all those hires and hires in this climate? So what we call Covering that, the, the bus ridership and, of course, the rail ridership as well. Join us for that conversation right here on Friday. We'll see you then. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.